Hello, Bourbon Real Talk listeners. Randy Sullivan here, going to talk with you today about something that affects all of us in the whiskey enthusiast community, and that is what some of us refer to as price gouging. Some people just call it overpriced bourbon. Is it capitalism or is it greed? We're going to get into that today. So first off, a little bit of a disclaimer. I'm going to be talking quite a bit today about three-tier system laws. I'm not an attorney. I'm not giving legal advice. These are my opinions. I'm going to be sharing some generalities, and I don't want anyone to get lost in the sauce, if you will, and get too detail-oriented about you know what percentage was this or what percentage was that. We want to look at things from the overall standpoint. Also, as I start to talk about producers and their motivations in this you know, three-tier system, I'm going to focus specifically on Buffalo Trace, mainly because they produced the Pappy Van Winkle line and the Buffalo Trace Antique Collection line, and those were some of the first bourbons and some of the bourbons that are most consistently overpriced by liquor stores. So if you're watching this, I assume you're a whiskey enthusiast, but you may have just stumbled across this, and this may come as a surprise to you, but there are liquor stores out there that are buying product and they're putting it on their shelves for sale for astronomically higher prices than what the manufacturer suggested retail price is. And when I say astronomically higher, I'm talking about you know, sometimes 10, 15, 20 times the amount that it's supposed to be sold for. And this is a very frustrating thing for a whiskey enthusiast to deal with because if it's a bottle that's marked up that much, it's probably something that they wish that they could buy and they wish that they could drink. If you didn't already know, there was a time period in the bourbon industry that was kind of like the dark ages. So starting in the late 60s or so through the 70s, 80s, and 90s, There weren't a lot of people that were drinking bourbon. Clear spirits had become very popular, and the major bourbon producers were kind of in turmoil. They were struggling to try and find a way to survive. They were trying to create new products that were some sort of a weird hybrid between a traditional bourbon and a clear spirit, which kind of turned out to be a failure. And there was a lot of consolidation in the industry, and a lot of brands went out of business. And if you were one of the top people in the bourbon industry and you live through that, you probably have a little bit of PTSD when you think about it because it was a very tumultuous time in the bourbon industry. I've spoken with multiple industry experts that lived through that and they just say that it was terrible. And that actually helps to set up how we ended up in a situation where there was even an opportunity for retailers to price these producers bourbon at such a high price. And things started to get a little bit weird in the late 20, 2008, 2010 timeframe. In the early 2000s, there was the beginning of what we call the bourbon boom. And people started to become interested in bourbon. A lot of uh, higher end cocktail bars started experimenting with making cocktails out of bourbons. People were being exposed to it for the first time. And people started to get more interested in bourbon for the first time in decades. And during this time frame, there was a little known brand called the, well, it's the Van Winkle line. And the most popular product that they had was the Pappy Van Winkle product. And it's still probably, arguably, the most popular bourbon on the market today that's an annual release bourbon that's not some like one time release. And in 2008, they won the International Wine and Spirits Competition. They won a trophy. Um, and it was, you know, rated one of the top spirits in the world. And they started to get a little bit of notoriety. And if you do research on how many times Pappy Van Winkle was searched on the internet, you start to see an increase in the number of searches right around that time. Then, only two years later, Wine and Spirits magazine named Pappy Van Winkle Spirit of the Year. And that's across all spirit categories, not just for bourbon. And at this point, everyone starts to focus on this brand Pappy Van Winkle. It was a premium line. It was generally made from older barrels that had come from a distillery called Stitzelweller. And the person that was making the whiskey didn't even make whiskey themselves. They would go, they'd sample barrels, they'd find the barrels that they liked, and they would blend it together, and they would make these batches, and that was it. And, and, and that individual actually struggled to keep 
his business afloat for years and years. And if you listen to their story, their family story, there were many times when they thought that the brand was maybe going to go out of business. But then around that 2008, 2010 timeframe is when they started to get a lot of really positive press and people really started paying attention to this Pappy Van Winkle line. And by this time, they had switched producers from the Stitzelweller distillery, which had gone out of business, and they started having their product made by a very large whiskey production company that's owned by Sazerac Corporation called Buffalo Trace. And Buffalo Trace doesn't just make Pappy Van Winkle, they make dozens of different products. And so, you know, he's just one small brand that's part of this huge conglomerate. And all of a sudden, in 2012, you really start to see a lot of interest in Pappy Van Winkle. So as this demand increased, it started to affect the demand for the other brand lines that that same distillery, Buffalo Trace, made at the time. And consumers now had the internet age, so they were able to go out and do research, and enthusiast groups started to really become popular in Facebook. I believe Facebook started uh, in 2006 and whiskey connoisseurs were able to meet each other and share information. And for the first time ever, people started to become aware that, hey, this distillery, they make Pappy Van Winkle. They also make some other products like William LaRue Weller, W.L. Weller, that are actually the same whiskey made with the same process, just not aged for the same amount of time, maybe a little bit of difference in proof. And so Buffalo Trace starts to get more attention as a whole. At the same time that all of this interest in these product lines is going up, the Facebook enthusiast community started to figure out that Facebook wouldn't stop you from using their platform to find other people who had the bottles that you couldn't find and buy it from them for a premium, what we generally refer to as the bourbon secondary market. And the secondary market started to grow and people started to become aware that you could buy these whiskeys and you could sell them for a massive profit immediately thereafter because there was so much demand and so many people who wanted these bourbons at prices that were quite a bit higher than what they were being sold for at the retail store. So it begs the question, why didn't Buffalo Trace just raise their prices to take advantage of this opportunity that was in the market? Well, we could debate about that all day long, but I have some theories that I'd like to share with you. Specifically with the Pappy Van Winkle line, they had created a family ph philosophy that it made more sense to have less bourbon than you had demand because they had gotten themselves in trouble in the past when they had inventory that they had to carry that they didn't have purchasers for, and that gave them business difficulties. The whole industry, in fact, had just gone through that bourbon dark age that we talked about earlier. And everyone's going to be a little bit gun shy about having too much whiskey. And so they would have been very afraid of raising their prices for fear that it would lower demand below the inventory that they had. And they'd possibly start another bourbon bust. They had just come out of it. And so I think it started off them just being afraid that they were going to chase away their customers. But then over time, there were some other things that started to happen that in my opinion gave them other strategic business reasons for keeping certain prices low when it was pretty obvious at that point that from an economic standpoint they could have raised the price and still had plenty of demand. And so this is a little bit of a controversial concept, but there's something in the whiskey industry called inducements. So first off, understand if you didn't know this, the company that makes the whiskey, it is illegal for them to sell that whiskey directly to consumers. Now, most states now have laws that they can sell a little bit out of their distillery gift shop, but for the most part, they're not allowed to sell directly to consumers. They have to go through a three-tier system. So the producer has to sell it to a wholesaler, and the wholesaler has to sell it to a retailer, and then the retailer has to sell it to the consumer. And in some states, bars and restaurants have to get it from the retailer too. Some states, they can get it from the, from the wholesaler. But regardless, it does have to go through that chain for it to legally be sold to a consumer. And so, like it or not, the people who are marketing that product at the wholesale level to the retailer don't just sell Pappy Van Winkle. They sell a lot of other products. And the reality is the Pappy Van Winkle line isn't that much revenue for anyone in this food chain because there's just not very many bottles. And so wholesalers and retailers make their money off of high volume products. 
And something very interesting happened with the parent company, Sazerac, that owned Buffalo Trace, and by extension, the Pappy Van Winkle line. Now, probably most of you by now have heard of a cinnamon whiskey called Fireball. I think that there was even a popular pop song about it. Well, Fireball has been around for a lot longer than most people knew what that product was. In fact, in 2000, I think it was 10, they reported gross sales of this, you know, Fireball cinnamon whiskey of $1.9 million. So under $2 million worth of gross revenue for that particular product line. But between the years of 2011 and 2014, they were able to grow that product from under $2 million to almost $1 billion in sales. It was something like 134 billion to consumer and then 850 something billion to bars and restaurants. And so we're talking about a significant asset and something that is astronomical growth for the spirits industry. And there's something called an inducement. It's not exactly legal, but basically the way that an inducement works is a wholesale rep would go into a retail location and say, hey, I'm sure you have a lot of customers coming in asking for Pappy Van Winkle. And I'm sure that you would like me to sell you some. But we really reserve that for our best customers. So if you wanna be one of our best customers, you're gonna to have to put up an end cap that has this fireball whiskey on it so that when people walk into the store, it's the first thing they see. We need you to sell X number of cases of it. We need you to sell this many, many bottles. We need you to have a mini bottle display up by your cash register so that when people are ringing out, it's right there. And we need you to get your volume up. Now, if you're Sazerac Corporation and you have the Pappy Van Winkle line, which actually, and it's really hard to get estimates on how much Pappy Van Winkle there is. There's, there's actually six different labels that they have. There's a 10, 12, 15, 20, 23, and a 13 year rye whiskey. And the estimates that I've been able to find say that they make about 84,000 bottles total in the entire line. And it's more likely that they make more of the younger, less expensive whiskeys. But if we assume that they made an equal number of each product line every year, and the average retail price for that bottle is about $150. That's the manufacturer suggested retail price because the top one's 300 and the bottom one's 70. And if you average it out, it's about 150. Now you may not know this, but because of the three tier system, if you were to pay $100 for a bottle of whiskey, the whiskey producer doesn't get $100. Typically about $25 of that is reserved for the retail store and about $15 is reserved for the wholesale tier. And so the producer on average, and don't kill me on this because I know that everyone's numbers are different, is somewhere around 60%. If we assume that the Pappy Van Winkle line operates off of a roughly 60% margin on a $150 bottle on 84,000 bottles per year, that means that the entire Van Winkle line is worth less than $8 million or so per year to the Sazerac Corporation. So if you're a Sazerac corporation and you can use the influence that you have through the three tier system with a $8 million a year product to build another product brand from $1.9 million to almost $1 billion in three short years, you're probably not going to raise the price of the product and reduce the demand for it. Because even if they increase their, their pricing by 100%, it wouldn't make any difference to the Sazerac Corporation compared to what they're able to do with that thing that we in the industry refer to as Pappy influence. Now, I will admit that that is completely illegal because the second tier is not allowed to use inducements for the third tier. But if you talk with anybody in the industry, you know that that was absolutely happening during this Pappy craze. So because consumers were becoming more aware of Buffalo Trace and their other products, the mania kind of spread against their entire product line. So that now even the products that Buffalo Trace used to consider kind of the, the bottom shelf products that they didn't even put a cork on, it had a screw top and you could go into any store and it was sitting on the bottom shelf and it was always there, it was ubiquitous, it was everywhere. Now all of a the sudden there's massive demand for even those products. 
But despite all that demand, Buffalo Trace still didn't raise their prices, which is what they would have needed to have done to reduce the demand and get the market back to something kind of normal. Here's a quote from Julian Van Winkle himself. Unfortunately, we do not control the prices retailers charge. So many retailers mark it up, even though we ask them not to, noted Julian Van Winkle, president, Old Rip Van Winkle Distillery. We have not raised prices, and we do not intend to do so drastically in the future. We are committed to our quality and our pricing and hope retailers will honor what we suggest as retail price. So as Julian mentioned in that statement, he doesn't have any control over what the retailers sell the product for. Why is that? Well, when the government created the three-tier system, it's basically a government-mandated monopoly, right? So the producer can't sell their product without the wholesaler, and the wholesaler can't sell their product without their retailer. And the government, in their wisdom, understood that the biggest person in that food chain would potentially have the financial ability to put pressure on the smaller members of that food chain. And so they put protections in place to make sure that the wholesaler wasn't putting pressure on the retailer and so on and so forth. And that's why inducements are illegal. The TTB, that's a federal governmental organization that's responsible for regulating all of this, has rules in place. And those rules have been in place since post-prohibition, whenever they created the three-tier system, to make sure that the wholesaler is not coming in and dictating to this small business owner exactly what they're supposed to do. But here's the problem. Those rules were instituted not to protect the retailer so that they could charge anything that they wanted. Those rules were put into place so that the retailer would be protected from downward pricing pressure from the producer and wholesaler level, not from upward pricing. So that brings us back to our original question. Is this overpriced bourbon good capitalism or is it greed? I am a pure capitalist. What does that mean? I believe that business owners should be free to set their pricing and run their business any way that they see fit without governmental influence and I think that that's part of the American way. Now, a lot of people say, well, capitalism is making as much money as you can. No, true capitalism is sustainable. So you wouldn't engage in any business practice that would cause a massive problem at some point in the future, like the 2008 mortgage you know, debacle, right? That wasn't capitalism, that was greed. So what's the definition of capitalism? The dictionary defines capitalism as an economic and political system in which a country's trade and industry are controlled by private owners for profit rather than by the state. In a truly capitalistic system, prices are set by the supply demand curve. Basically, if you were to look at an axis and one side represents supply and the other side represents demand, there's gonna be a point at those two cross and that's going to be the thing that sets the market price for whatever that product is. If you end up in a situation where supply is less than demand, then prices have to go up. And if you end up in a situation where demand is less than supply, then prices have to go down. So as a capitalist, it would make sense that I would be happy about these retail stores increasing the price because obviously supply is less than demand. But how do I feel about a retail store that takes a product like say, WL Weller Single Barrel, which is a new release product there are other variations of this product that have been out for years and years. And when they released it, it had a manufacturer suggested retail price of $49.99. But this retail store, instead of releasing it for that price, released it for $899.99. Or how about this example? George T. Stagg, my favorite bourbon of all time, has a suggested retail price of $100. And the same retail store had it priced for $699.99. So to understand how we got into this situation where a retail store can charge many times more the MSRP for a product and still have customers come in and buy it, I'd like you to consider this one example. I have in my possession a picture of a retail store that has two bottles side by side, both highly sought after. One of them is a Weller Foolproof, which is a 
another variation of that same product we just mentioned, the Weller Single Barrel, but this one they don't add any water to before they put it into the bottle. So it's considered a cash strength whiskey, and it's also a relatively new release, and it's pretty similar to another very sought after product that we would consider its big brother, William LaRue Weller. And when they released this product, it had a manufacturer suggested retail price of $49.99. But this store, in this photo, has it priced for $699.99, and I've seen a different location of that same store that had it priced for $899.99. Now, right next to that bottle is a bottle of highly sought after scotch. It's the Balvini 30 gear. And that bottle typically sells for around $1,200. Even large national box stores that never price gouge, that's about the price that they have it at. Understanding how this store could have drastically different pricing for two highly sought after bottles will help us understand what's going on in the industry that's led to this. I believe that Buffalo Trace knows at this point that today they have enough demand that they could increase pricing and still could sell out 100% of their product. I think that originally they started off deciding not to do that because they were worried that they were going to stop this bourbon renaissance and put themselves back into a you know bourbon bus, which everybody wanted to avoid. Then I think that they stumbled across Pappy influence and how valuable that was as a marketing tool versus the little bit of money that they could get by raising pricing. But if you go forward, at this point, every single product line that they have is on allocation, even their screw top things. And so there's, there's no reason for them to continue to keep prices as low as they are or maybe there is. See, I have a little bit of a theory, and that theory is that Buffalo Trace is actually a for-profit organization. They are not some sort of a philanthropy organization. They are making and selling whiskey to make money. And at this point, they could obviously make a whole lot more money if they raise their prices. But if you look around, I think it was August of 2020, Buffalo Trace released a press release and said that they have a $1.2 billion expansion coming. Another factor that I believe is affecting Buffalo Trace and other producers and causing them to not want to increase pricing is because they may believe that there's false demand in the market. So as we discussed already, Facebook groups cropped up that were allowing people to trade this whiskey. Well, when you have a, pro a product that's priced below what the true market value is, now all of a sudden you're gonna generate false demand because originally you had people who wanted to buy the product because they wanted to drink it. But now you have people that wanna buy the product because they wanna make a profit. And that's additional demand coming into the market that's not real and it's not sustainable. If they fix the supply issue, that, that part of the demand curve would go away entirely. And in 2019, the Van Winkle family at the Bourbon and Beyond Music Festival announced that they and other Sazerac officials were working with government officials to try and get rid of the secondary market. Now this is something that's always confused me because everybody with half a wit knows that the secondary market is what's caused this bourbon boom to go as far as it has. Buffalo Trace has benefited immensely from this and the greatest beneficiary has probably been the Pappy Van Winkle line. So why would they wanna get rid of the secondary? That part just blows my mind. But if you're in their situation and you think that part of the reason why you would be able to raise your prices is because this false demand that's out there in the market and you're working hard to get rid of it, when that demand is gone, if you've raised your prices, boom, all of a sudden you've got inventory that you can't sell. And as we've already discussed, they don't wanna do that. Another interesting thing to consider is that we've seen the scotch industry make the wise decision to raise their prices until they normalize the market. But there's a big difference between scotch and bourbon. And that is the world-class scotches that are the most sought after take 20, 30, 40 years for them to make. But many of the most sought after bourbons are made in somewhere between six and 12 years. So as a producer of scotch, you might have a scotch boom going on right now. And you might decide that you're gonna invest money to increase your capacity so that you can take care of this demand. And somewhere around 30 years from now, you're gonna be able to take advantage of that. That's a pretty big gamble. And so scotch, has no choice. They can't increase capacity and try and take advantage of this boom, but bourbon can. 
And I believe that that's why Buffalo Trace has decided to leave things the way that they are in terms of pricing and invest heavily into expansion and increasing their capacity because they will be able to get enough bourbon out there in the marketplace before this demand goes around, away and at the price that they're currently selling at or maybe a little bit more, but they'll be able to sell a much larger volume of product. And so it makes a whole lot of sense for them to keep demand mm, at a high level above what their current inventory is just so that they don't end up wasting the 1.2 or $1.3 billion that they're spending on expansion. Now, it's not as if Buffalo Trace has never tried to increase prices or any of the other brands for that matter. But there's something that happens whenever one of these big producers increases the price even just a little bit. And that is there's a huge backlash with their customer base. All of a sudden, everybody who's been drinking that whiskey since they were knee high to a grasshopper has a problem with the price increase. And this is nonsense. And I've always been a loyal consumer. And there's almost this attitude out there that bourbon is some, somehow a public trust and that it's not owned by billion dollar corporations that have spent hundreds of millions of dollars building and buying these brands. No. You don't own the bourbon. The company does, and they should be free to do with their pricing what they see fit. And as a producer, I can kind of see how the backlash that they've received from small increases makes them weary to increase the price all the way up to market level if they know that they have a bunch of capacity coming online and that those old timers that they're relying on to continue to buy the product whenever they do get the volume back up are going to be upset and leave and go drink other brands. I also get a little bit frustrated with all the conspiracy theorists out there that have some sort of an idea that the brand has enough supply to handle demand. It's just that they're keeping, you know, demand falsely high by not releasing all the product that they have. I don't think that's true. When you think about the amount of money that's invested in this, and especially a publicly traded company, they, they are under so much pressure to hit earnings projections and all of this stuff. If they had the ability to increase their revenue without having a long-term negative consequence, I believe that they would do it. So I'm not a huge fan of the people who act like bourbon is somehow a public trust, and I'm not a huge fan of the people who have conspiracy theories that the companies are keeping demand falsely high. Now, whether you agree with my theories as to why these producers have decided not to raise their pricing or not, I think that we can all agree that everybody in the bourbon industry knows that at this point they could have raised their prices, but they haven't, or at least not to the level that I would if I owned the brand, right? And so why haven't they done that? Well, we can assume that there's some strategic business reason. It may be so that they could take advantage of capacity, that's coming online. It could be something else. I don't know, but we can at least agree that there's a strategic business reason that they're deciding not to raise the price. Now, that's where I start to have a problem with the retailer raising the price. Because as a small business owner, I would not like it very much if I had made a strategic business decision to keep my pricing at a certain point. And obviously, I believe that if I don't do that, it's gonna have a long-term negative consequence on my business as the pr producer. If I was in an industry where by law, I had to pass my product or my service through to somebody else, and I didn't have the ability to keep them from increasing the price after I had already decided not to do it, I would be pretty upset if they did that. And I think that's why you're seeing statements like we heard from Julian earlier. They do not want whatever that negative business consequence is to be foisted upon them by some retailer who wants to make a bunch of extra money per bottle. So if the producers are asking the retailers not to do this, why are the retailers doing this? Let's deal with the fact that retail stores are extremely expensive to run and you have to have a huge volume of business to even cover the operational cost. The number of these highly allocated bottles that these stores end up with, even if they sold them all at an outrageous price, it really isn't going to make that much of an annual difference to their budget because they just don't get very many bottles. And so I don't think that it's purely profit driven. I think that these re retail stores may be increasing their prices so much because they don't want to have to deal with the consequences of having that lower price retail bottle and everybody that that upsets. If you're a retail store and you have 100 people who want to buy a bottle of Pappy Van Winkle from you at the MSRP and 
you sell it to one of them and the other 99 find out, well, you might lose 99 customers. They probably also don't want to deal with trying to figure out which people are buying the product because they're a good customer and they want to open the bottle and drink it with friends or which customers are coming in to try and get that bottle so that they can flip it and make the profit that the store forwent just so that they could sell it at retail price. The alternative to all of these issues is actually kind of complicated from a business standpoint because you can use those bottles that you get to help strengthen customer relationships and increase volume sales from consistent customers that are gonna come in, but you actually gotta be paying quite a bit of attention. And if you do it wrong, it ends up costing you more than you, than you ended up making by selling those bottles at the MSRP price. The main reason that I hate this business practice is because from a functional standpoint, who ends up paying for these bottles at these outrageously high prices? So take, for example, the Weller Foolproof that we talked about. We've seen it at $699.99. We've seen it at $899.99. It's supposed to be a $49 bottle. Who would pay that price? Well, the thing is, is Weller Foolproof is a relatively new brand. And the average consumer that goes in there that drinks, you know, Jim Beam or Jack Daniels or whatever it is that they drink, they have no idea what Weller Foolproof is. So that person's just gonna walk in, see that bottle up there with that big price tag and go, oh wow, look at that fancy whiskey I can't afford. They're not gonna buy that bottle. If they don't know what it is, they're not gonna spend that amount of money on the bottle. So they just kind of walk away, right? Now the whiskey enthusiast that's really involved in the whiskey community is gonna walk in there and go, hey, I can buy that bottle and I don't know what it is right now, but there are still secondary sites out there and, and friends talk with one another. And if I wanted to, I could probably get one of those bottles for somewhere between $250 and $400. I don't really mess with the secondary anymore, but you know that's probably about what the price range is for that bottle. And if you pay that price, someone will bring it to your house and you know they'll open it up with you and have a drink. They, if they live out of state, they'll ship it to your front door for that price. And so if I know that I can get a bottle for say $250, why would I pay $699 at a retail store to get it? I wouldn't, it just doesn't make any sense. And so if people who don't know what the bottle actually is are going to do it, and people who do know what the bottle is aren't going to do it, who ends up buying it? Well, that's where the moral dilemma comes in because the person that's most likely to buy that bottle is an uninformed loved one of a whiskey enthusiast. You know who would buy me that bottle? My mom or my dad for maybe my birthday or Christmas because they've been around, they've seen in my closet, they know that I like, you know, William LaRue Weller. They recognize the name, they've heard me talk about it, but they don't know what it's worth. They don't know how to find it on the secondary. They're not in the whiskey enthusiast community. And so a loved one of a whiskey enthusiast might walk in there, look up there, recognize the label, think that that's what it just costs and have no idea and buy that bottle and give it as a gift. And that store is taking advantage of the loved ones of whiskey enthusiasts. And I have a problem with that. So in conclusion, a retailer who gets their allocated bottles and they charge some sort of a price that's between MSRP and what would be considered the secondary or black market price, if you will, I don't know, I guess from a capitalistic standpoint, I could consider that a legitimate business practice. I still don't like the fact that it could have a negative consequence on the producer who decided not to do that uh, for all of the reasons we've already discussed. But I would say for sure that any retailer that's raising prices above secondary, especially significantly above secondary, is engaging in an immoral practice. It's just greed, it's not capitalism, and I'm 100% against that. So if you like this content and you want to check out more Bourbon Real Talk, you can see us at bourbonrealtalk.com. You can find us on YouTube forward slash Bourbon Real Talk. You can also find us on Facebook forward slash Bourbon Real Talk. We're on Instagram and we'd love it if you would subscribe, like, review, and comment on your favorite podcast player or maybe on YouTube. And if you woke up this morning and you're unsure whether or not anyone loved you, just know that I love you and I'll see you next time on Bourbon Real Talk. This content is being brought to you by the Bourbon Real Talk American Whiskey Aroma Kit. This is a tool that I put together to help all you whiskey aficionados out there develop your palates. You can sit down with the vials and train your senses, or you can sit down with a great dram and break that whiskey down to its components. If you have any interest in purchasing a kit of your own, head on over to bourbonrealtalk.com forward slash shop and pick one up.
Thank you for listening.